Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the opening debate. I'm just going to give you a little bit of the substance of the debate and then the logistics of the uh, debate. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chavez and Professor Kennedy, for sharing your time, your expertise, and your thoughts. So as you all know, the title of the debate is What Should Be the Role of Affirmative Action in Higher Education Admissions? This, of course, is a loaded question because reasonable people can disagree with what the phrase affirmative action means. Our speakers will help us to parse through that issue. To give you some context, there is the first question, of course, of can race be a factor? Uh, and the US Supreme Court is revisiting that question next term. The second question is, even if race can be a factor, should race be a factor uh, in a uh, college and university's admission uh, decisions. Some sub-questions under this second question are as follows. What do we mean when we say, should we consider race? What does it mean to consider race? Is race a factor? Are you talking about quotas? What does it mean to consider race? Is consideration of race or, race or ethnicity necessary? Why? What purpose does it serve? Are there any drawbacks to considering race? If there are drawbacks, do those drawbacks outweigh the benefits of considering race and ethnicity? All right, so a lot of very uh, difficult questions. I chair, I have chaired in the past the admissions committee at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I can tell you this is a complex and nuanced question without a lot of easy answers. Uh, so the logistics, Professor Kennedy will speak first with his opening remarks for about 15 minutes. Then Ms. Chavez will spend 15 minutes presenting her opening remarks. Professor Kennedy will then have five minutes to address Ms. Chavez's remarks if he so chooses. Ms. Chavez will then have five minutes to address Professor Kennedy's remark, again, if she so chooses. And then I'll start the ball rolling with a question for Professor Kennedy, a question for Ms. Chavez, and then we'll open the floor up to you all uh, with Ryan in his roving microphone. <laughs> okay, the event will conclude at 8.30 p.m. So Professor Kennedy will begin. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be with you at uh, this event. The next few days uh, promise to be very exciting and, and instructive, and I certainly hope that this evening will contribute to uh, your thinking about these very important subjects. So affirmative action and higher education. What should be the role of affirmative action in higher education admissions? Um, my position is that uh, affirmative action has been very useful uh, and that it should remain uh, an important part of uh, admissions in higher education. Uh, but before proceeding with uh, my brief, not simply in defense of affirmative action. I'm not simply a defender of affirmative action. I'm a champion of affirmative action. Um, let's, though, before we get to that, to make sure that we're just talking to one another, let's get some definitions, though, so affirmative action. Affirmative action, in my view, is any policy that self-consciously attempts to uh, uh, preference uh, a given um, uh, 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 candidates uh, who are associated with a given group. And you can have affirmative action of all sorts. You can have affirmative action that is based on geography. And in fact, many institutions do. Some institutions um, have a preference for, let's say, people in state or a preference for people who are out of state. Uh, there are institutions that have preferences for veterans. There are institutions that have preferences that, are, that sound in gender. There are institutions that have preferences that sound in age. Now, we're going to talk about racial affirmative action, but I do want to just put it out there right at the beginning that race needs to be put in the context of 
other considerations that are typically not viewed as particularly controversial. And one thing that we want, might want to talk about is why is it that when we talk about racial affirmative action, our, our intuitions, our views are so different than when we talk about other sorts of considerations that we, you know, we commonly take into account. Now, affirmative action can come in a, in, a, in a wide variety of forms. Not only do we take different attributes into account, but different affirmative action uh, programs have different intensities. So you can have affirmative action that's based purely in terms of, let's say, outreach. This doesn't usually provoke much uh, controversy, but that's a certain sort of affirmative action. You're going to make a special effort to tell certain sectors of the population about a particular opportunity. Maybe, you're, maybe your institution hasn't had many, let's say, Latinos or many blacks or many women. And you make a special effort to tell these various sectors of the population, hey, we're interested in you. We'd welcome applications from you. Well, that's a type of affirmative action. Uh, another type of affirmative action is um, often viewed not as affirmative action at all. So for instance, the state of Texas. T Texas uh, passed a what they called a, a top 10% law. In the state of Texas, if you're in the top 10% of your high school, you are automatically admitted to the University of Texas. Now, that's open to everyone, but one purpose for that, in fact, the main purpose for the passage of that law was to make sure that the University of Texas would have a larger percentage of Latinos and blacks. People often refer to this law as race neutral because it's open to everyone, regardless of race, but the purpose of it, the self-conscious purpose, was to increase the number of Latinos, number of blacks. It seems to me that, that there's an example of affirmative action. The most controversial sort of affirmative action, however, is the sort of affirmative action that gives a definite preference to members of, uh, of uh, minority groups, racial minority groups. And so in the competition for admission to schools, like the competition to admission to a school like this one, would be to give a preference to people who are identified with a particular race, um, particularly uh, African Americans and other historically marginalized racial groups. Again, I don't just defend such programs, I champion such programs. Why? Four things in particular. Number one, reparative justice. The fact of the matter is we live in a society in which various racial minorities, particularly African Americans, have been historically disadvantaged, historically oppressed. Mention was made at the outset that the Supreme Court of the United States has on its docket this year a case involving affirmative action, racial affirmative action, that comes from, of all places, the University of Texas. In 1948, there was a black person, Heman Sweat, who wanted to attend the University of Texas Law School. He was completely qualified to attend the University of Texas Law School. In fact, the dean of the University of Texas Law School wrote him and said, you know what? You have a very fine record. You are actually eligible except for one thing except for one thing, you're black, and we don't allow the, the, Texas the Texas Constitution forbids uh, blacks and whites to be educated in the same institution. Now, this is 1948. Now, I know that you know, for some of you, you might think that 1948 was long ago, you know, like when the dinosaur roamed. 1948 was not long ago at all. And oftentimes when people are talking about racial oppression in the United States, we have the sense that this was something that happened long ago. 
Immediately, for instance, people think about slavery. Forget slavery. I'll spot you slavery. There are millions of people living in the United States now who were subjected to Jim Crow oppression. There are people right here amongst us now. We don't have to go way back. Right now, right here, who were subjected to Jim Crow oppression. They were told that they could not access resources because of their race. That had effects on them. That had effects on their children. Those effects are still with us. And one of the purposes of affirmative action is to redress the scars of racial oppression, the debilitations of racial oppression that are still with us. Second, integration, legitimation. One of the reasons why we have affirmative action in practically all of the strategic, all of the important, all of the significant institutions of American life, not only in higher education, but in practically all of the strategic institutions of American life, has to do with trying to show Americans that we've turned a page, that we want everybody to be included. There has been a racially mixed, a racially integrated presidential cabinet with every president since Lyndon Johnson. Is that happenstance? It's not happenstance. Up until Lyndon Johnson, there had never been an African American in a presidential cabinet. Since then, there has always been an African American in a presidential cabinet, including in the cabinets of presidents that said that they were against affirmative action. Ronald Reagan, blacks in his cabinets. The elder George Bush, the younger Bush, said they were against affirmative action, made sure they had an African American, at least one, <laughs> in the cabinet. Now, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. I think that, that where does that come from? It comes from a sense that it would simply be inconceivable, it would be intolerable to have a major institution that did not reflect somehow did not reflect the presence of a multicultural, multiracial America. Legitimacy called for that. That's a second reason for racial affirmative action. Third, one that's not talked about much, but I think it's in the mix, I think it ought to be talked about. Affirmative action serves as a sort of a prophylactic against ongoing racial discrimination. We all know that there's ongoing racial discrimination. Sometimes it's caught, you know, officially in litigation, you know, in courtrooms, but oftentimes it's not. But it's an invisible wind. And as a way of hedging against that invisible wind, as preempting that invisible wind. We put a thumb on the scale for those who we know day in and day out in countless ways are going to encounter, are going to continue to encounter racial, invidious racial discrimination. Finally, finally, fourth, is a so-called diversity justification for affirmative action, particularly in institutions of higher education, the idea being that having a racially diverse uh, student body is pedagogically good, pedagogically sound, pedagogically essential. 
This is the justification that the Supreme Court of the United States has embraced. It'll be front and center when the United States Supreme Court confronts the affirmative action case on its docket. I think, it, frankly, it's an important justification, though, in my view, it is the least important of the four that I've mentioned. Our Supreme Court, to its discredit, has marginalized the first three that I've mentioned and has only allowed us to talk about the fourth. I think that the fourth is important. But I frankly, to me, the fourth, the diversity justification for affirmative action is, to my mind, the least compelling, though compelling. Now, let me end my remarks by just adding just a, a, a few caveats, a few qualifications. First of all, Am I up here defending each and every affirmative action plan in the United States of America? No. No, I'm not. I'm up here defending sensibly designed affirmative action. Can you have stupidly designed affirmative action? Of course you can. Of course you can. Affirmative action is like any other public policy, it can be well designed, it can be, or it can be stupidly designed, it can be badly designed. Um, I'm for sensible affirmative action, and I recognize that we have to be attentive to the design of these programs. Um, do I think that Racial affirmative action is the sort of the end all and be all? No, I do not. I think we need much more of various sorts of affirmative action. There, there, are, good many, there are a lot of poor, poor white people in the United States that need a break and that should get a break. I'm all for, for instance, class affirmative action but I do not want class affirmative action to be pitted against racial affirmative action. We have all sorts of inequities in American life, along lines of gender, sexual orientation, class, race, and others as well. And we need to push on all of these avenues we should ought not allow ourselves to be divided. We need more social justice in the United States. Race is one, it's not the exclusive one, but it's still an important one. I think we are a much better society for what has happened over the past 30 to 40 years with respect to affirmative action, not only in higher education, but as I said, in the major institutions of American life. It ought to be defended. It ought to be commended. It ought to be championed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a, a particular pleasure to be here with Randy Kennedy. Uh, much of what Randy said today, uh, I agree with, but some of it I do not. And I'd like to start really not talking so much about the law and the state of the law with respect to affirmative action, but start with a little bit of personal history. Uh, I, my, one of my very first jobs was at the University of Colorado, uh, and I helped start an affirmative action program at the University of Colorado that was sponsored by the United Mexican American Students. 
Uh, the year was 1969, and the university had very, very few Mexican-American students, had very few black students uh, in the university system. And this was a time of a lot of turmoil, a lot of pressure to engage in affirmative action. And so the university decided that it was going to admit 350 black and 350 Mexican-American students. Uh, it was assumed that the students that would be admitted uh, might not be able to meet the normal qualifications to go to the university. And so the idea was to bring people in who were not necessarily prepared and to offer them essentially one extra year uh, toward uh, what was going to be a five-year degree to try to bring them up to speed. And I helped design the English uh, program uh, for that uh, particular affirmative action uh, program. And was, I was very enthusiastic about it. It seemed to make a whole lot of sense. You know, when I heard stories about Ray Warren, I am sorry that I never got to meet him because it sounds like some of what he uh, did for this school was some of what we did at the University of Colorado. I actually went around the state uh, down to the small towns of southern Colorado, which were heavily Mexican-American, into the west part of Denver, uh, which had a large Mexican-American population. We went to places like pool halls looking for kids uh, after school to uh, recruit to the university. And the whole idea was that we would bring them in and give them the skills they needed to be able to compete after that first year on an equal footing. Well, in the course of that year, uh, the program became very politicized. Many of the students ended up uh, getting much more involved in radical political activity a few years uh, after the program started. Some of my former students actually blew themselves up in a car uh, where they were transporting a bomb to campus. It became a very radicalized program. And I guess it was my involvement in that program that uh, colored my views on this issue uh, in large part. But there was also uh, another uh, way in which my personal history uh, helped form the views that I hold now on affirmative action. And I was actually not old enough, or, or I was too old, I should say, to have benefited from affirmative action uh, at the undergraduate level. Uh, I'm significantly older than, than Professor uh, Kennedy and started uh, college in 1965, and there were no affirmative action programs at that time. But by 1970, um, there were, and that was uh, the point at which that I, I had graduated and was applying for graduate school. And uh, I was one of the top students, maybe the top student in the English department uh, at that time, and I wanted to get a PhD. But I come from a working class background. My dad was a house painter, my mother worked in restaurants and retail uh, sales, and so I didn't have the money to be able to uh, pay for that uh, higher education, much less graduate school. Uh, and by the time 1970 rolled around, I was already married. I married at 19, and I already had a, uh, a child. And so I needed to be able to, to get a scholarship. Well, the Ford Foundation at the time was offering fellowships for Mexican-American students, and so I applied for one of these. And I flew out to New York City, it was my very first time in an airplane, and I went into the interview to be interviewed uh, for this graduate fellowship that was specifically aimed at Mexican-American students. And I was very nervous, you know, it was obviously a very big deal for me, and I sat down and suddenly I was being bombarded with questions. One of the interviewers insisted on interviewing me in Spanish. Well. I don't speak Spanish. I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Uh, I grew up in a home uh, where English was the primary language. So I was very, very nervous, and the interview sort of went downhill from there. And at the end of the interview, one of the three people who was interviewing looked at me, and he said, you know, there is a problem. 
with you as an applicant, and it has to do with your GRE scores, your graduate record scores. Well, I was, uh, you know, suddenly very, very nervous, and I started to explain that my son had had colic, and I was up all night the night before the GREs, and I really didn't do as well as I should have done, and he stopped me right there. And he said, no, the problem isn't that you didn't do well enough. I think my cumulative score was something like in the 93rd percentile. He said, no, the problem is your score is higher than anyone else who's applied. You don't need our help. You are not the kind of student that we are looking for. And that incident really clarified for me that some of the people that were involved in affirmative action had what I considered a very patronizing, if not outright racist, view of what race and ethnicity meant, and that if you didn't fit the stereotype, if you didn't have an accent, if you were well-dressed and well-spoken and actually spoke English, I was going to get a PhD in English literature, so one would hope that I spoke English well, um, that you couldn't be disadvantaged. And I found that deeply disturbing. And I guess that did, in many ways, uh, tell me that many of the affirmative action programs that I think were well-meaning looked at students of color differently from other students and said that if they knew your name was Chavez or Martinez or Lopez or if you were an African American uh, or a Native American, that you could not be presumed to meet the same standards as other students. That in order to um, give you affirmative action, in order to give you a racial preference, it was presumed that you would not meet those standards, and so the standards would have to be adjusted. And that really, for me, crystallized one of the main problems I had with the affirmative action programs that really, I think, transmogrified, particularly throughout the 1970s, that went from being the kinds of programs that Professor Kennedy has talked about in terms of programs that were involved in reaching out and making sure that the applicant pool was diverse, that uh, gave extra help to people who may not have had the advantages, the social and economic advantages, may not have been able to go to the, to the same types of schools, may not have had the same preparation to take the SATs, et cetera, and to try to give a helping hand so that those skills, in fact, could be built up, but instead presumed that race or ethnicity was somehow a proxy for disadvantage. And that's where I think uh, Professor Kennedy and I have the biggest difference. I am all in favor of affirmative action programs that are aimed at helping disadvantaged students. But my problem is that when government gets into the business of picking and choosing who is going to be a winner and who is going to be a loser, in this lottery, and that basis on which they pick the winner and the loser happens to be race or ethnicity, it is a very, very dangerous game. And one that, frankly, um, has been the way the game was played for 200 years in this society, and one that greatly disadvantaged racial minorities. When we talk about restributive, uh, I'm sorry, restorative justice, uh, as, as Professor Kennedy has, I have no problem with actual victims of discrimination being made whole by programs that, in fact, give them uh, the benefit of the doubt and, in fact, restore the justice that they were denied. I do have a problem, however, in assuming that every member of a particular racial or ethnic room, uh, group uh, is, in fact, in that same position and therefore should be given 
an extra um, account on the base of on the basis of their race or ethnicity. I think the idea of using race and ethnicity as a proxy is a very, very dangerous thing. And when the government picks winners, they also pick losers. And I think uh, the Center for Equal Opportunity, which I founded 20 years ago, has been over the course of the last two decades one of the main groups to do studies of college admissions uh, and analyze college admissions uh, and the way in which race is used by public institutions to determine who's going to be admitted. One of the big problems is that when you give an advantage to a black student or a Mexican-American student or other Hispanic student or a Native American, and you deny at that advantage uh, to others, uh, you end up penalizing people, some of whom may themselves have the same kinds of social and economic disadvantage as members of the group you're trying to help. And Asian Americans, I think, are the group that are most affected by this. There's a long history of racism, uh, institutional racism against Asians in American history. I spend a lot of my time on the immigration issue, and anyone who has studied immigration knows that the immigration restriction movement began not attempting to restrict Mexican Ameri Mexicans from coming to America, but began in the late 19th century by restricting the Chinese from coming to America. Uh, the uh, Asian uh, Americans were not even allowed to become U.S. citizens until the middle of the 20th century. They were denied when they came here the right to be able to marry. Um, they were not allowed to marry uh, other Americans. There were some exceptions in some states like California where they were allowed to marry Mexicans uh, but were not allowed to marry whites. Now the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of some of those who had been uh, discriminated against are now being discriminated against in favor of students who are black or who are Hispanic uh, as a result of affirmative action programs. So I really believe that it is dangerous when government gets into picking winners and losers. I think that's not worked well for us in our history, and I would uh, venture to, to bet that when the Fisher case, which is the one that uh, Professor Kennedy alluded to, comes before the Supreme Court again, that we will see that uh, the Supreme Court decides that the uh, program uh, at the University of Texas, which is being challenged, which is the very one that Professor Kennedy described, which gives uh, guarantees admissions to uh, all students who graduate from Texas high schools who are in the top 10% of their class, that was initially put in, as uh, Professor Kennedy suggested, to try to increase the number of black and Hispanic students in the University of Texas system. Uh, however, uh, even though it did in fact accomplish that, the university decided that it hadn't gone far enough and so began to try again to use race specifically and ethnicity uh, to give preference to uh, more black and Hispanic students in the university's uh, terms uh, to create a critical mass of such students so that the university overall not only had a larger number of these students, but that individual classes would. Uh, and that has been challenged uh, by uh, a student, uh, in, an undergraduate at the University of Texas, and it's gone up to the Supreme Court. Uh, now it's going up again for the second time. And the Supreme Court will have to decide whether or not uh, the, the program does in fact meet the constitutional test that says that race, whenever it is used by government, is subject to uh, a much higher uh, strict scrutiny uh, to make sure that it serves a compelling state interest and that it is narrowly tailored. I think the idea of affirmative action, if it is to be successful, if it is to be accepted, should be restricted to efforts at outreach 
that that outreach should be broad and that it should include not just students who happen to be of the two main groups that receive preference, which are Hispanics and, Asia, and uh, blacks, but rather it should be aimed in a way that will include others who may come from social and economically disadvantaged backgrounds. I think if the goal is to try to give assistance to those who need it, who may not have grown up with the same advantages as others, that that would serve a much better purpose. And frankly, um, I think that if you happen to be black and, or you happen to be Hispanic and your parents happen to be wealthy, that the idea that you should be given some advantage in being admitted uh, to college, much less at being promoted in a, in a job or being hired in a job, uh, does not serve uh, the interests of justice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Just a few points. One, on the, on the last one, you know, I think that the question of aims is really quite important, and we do need to distinguish you know, what are we really seeking to accomplish? I think we can seek to accomplish a wide variety of aims. One very, seems to me, justifiable aim is to confront our nation's terrible history of racial oppression. That's not to say that there are not other sorts of inequities. Uh, yeah, absolutely, there are all sorts of inequities that have scarred our national life. But one is racial oppression that often overlaps with socioeconomic uh, disadvantage, but not necessarily. And racial oppression is, it's, is, a, is, a, is a, its own discrete problem, and it seems to me that it's perfectly fine for our institutions, including our institutions of higher education, to um, be enlisted in challenging that problem. Is there, are there, is there a downside? Are there downsides with racial affirmative action? Sure there are. You mentioned some of them. Um, is there a problem, for instance, of stigmatization? Yes, there is. There, there's, there's, seems to me there's no two ways about it. That if you have a program, and as part of your program, the whole point of the program is to render assistance to people who are associated with a given group, you know, part of the logic of that is, you know, there are going to be some people who say, well, why do they need assistance? That m must mean that they're not as, you know, they're, 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 they're not as qualified. It might very well be. I don't, you know, I don't think that people should be, sometimes my sense is among, you know, my camp proponents of affirmative action, sometimes there's a certain sort of shame or something I am a beneficiary of affirmative action, no two ways about it. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that at all. Um, in order to, in order to um, uh, flourish in the competition of American life, me and hundreds of thousands of people like me who have suffered from American racism. I'm from Columbia, I'm from South Carolina, that's my home state, that's where I was born. My mother, who's still with us, lived at 1010 Oak Street, 1010 Oak Street was 10 minutes away from the University of South Carolina. It would have been the perfect place for my mother to have attended school. She could not go to the University of South Carolina. She went where all of my other relatives went. She went to South Carolina State College in Orangeburg, 
which is where the black people went. Now, my mother, wonderful person, made a way. Was she diminished? Was her human capital diminished by racism? Yes, it was. Sure it was. Racial oppression exacts a cost. Let's not pretend that it doesn't. You know, when people talk about the, these various gaps, where do these gaps come from? When people grew up, grow, grew up in houses without books, with parents who couldn't attend college, there needs not be any shame about that. Let's face it and let's do something about it. And affirmative action is one of the things, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that our society has attempted to do to grapple with the legacy of racial oppression. There are other downsides with affirmative action. Affirmative action has downsides, but every social policy, so does the tax system. Tax system has downsides. And then when we confront the downsides, we, we tinker with it. If the, you know, if, 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 if something isn't right over here, okay, let's, let's, let, let's change it. I'm not saying that affirmative action is an, an untouchable. That's not what I'm saying. I'm defending the ethos behind it. Is it right? that in the United States of America, special efforts are made to lend a hand to groups in American life that had been systematically oppressed, not a long, long, long time ago, but that have been systematically oppressed in the recent past and are still systematically oppressed. Disadvantage. Disadvantage is a very difficult, you're, you, the question of proxy, it's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult thing. There was a guy who wrote a book, I think his name was Richard Sennett, wrote a book called The Hidden Injuries of Class. The Hidden Injuries of Class. The Hidden Injuries of Race. The fact of the matter is, and we've seen that recently. We've seen it. We've seen it in our recent past. Racism is so deep. It is so subtle. It is so insidious. It has affected us. And by the way, all of us, black people too, me too, it has affected us in ways that actually, as we go on, we're, we're still discovering. It is not at all a clear thing. And so, I'm up here defending not a, partic a particular program, I'm defending the proposition that it is not simply justifiable. I think it should be obligatory. The tragedy is we're talking about whether we can have affirmative action. It should be obligatory on us to have affirmative action. It should be required, and much more. The remarkable thing about the affirmative action story, frankly, is affirmative action is such a small thing as we practice it, a rather narrow thing. The fact that there is so much opposition to programs that frankly cuts so superficially in our society. 
The problem with affirmative action is there ain't enough of it. If we talk about affirmative action, for instance, with respect to higher education, we are talking about people who are actually relatively privileged. I mean, frankly, if you're even, you know, if you're thinking about going to medical school, if you're thinking about going to law school, you're a privileged person. If you're thinking about going to law school, that means that you, you know, you've gotten through college. What about all the kids who don't make it to college? We need, to, I'm not saying let's do away with affirmative action, nope. Let's continue to have that, but we need to expand the egalitarian ethos in our society. We need to expand the avenues of increased opportunity. What's so striking is we're holding on to affirmative action, which is itself, like I say, rather narrow, helps out people who are relatively privileged. We're not even talking about the masses of people who are really being smashed into the dirt of American life. And we need to talk more about them as we continue to defend and expand what we already have. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Kennedy claims to want more affirmative action, but in fact, affirmative action in higher education is virtually universal. When the Center for Equal Opportunity has gone out and studied school admissions, and we've done this now for more than four dozen schools uh, around the country, from the South to the Midwest to the West to the East, we've done it at the military academies, every single school that we studied showed that students were given preference in admission based on race. And it wasn't a tiny bit of preference. When we looked at the odds ratios of getting into a school with the same test scores and grades, if you were a white student applying to the University of Wisconsin and had the same grades uh, as the average black student who got in, the black student had a 500 to 1 greater odds of getting accepted to the University of Wisconsin as the white student did. And we've seen this, that was one of the most egregious, but we've seen it uh, in every school that we studied. I think the, the one school that we didn't see that was at George Mason University, which also happens to be my alma mater from my Master of Fine Arts. But virtually all of the schools public colleges, because those are the only ones that we can take a look at, the only ones we have access to the data, in fact, use race and ethnicity. When Professor Kennedy talks about needing more affirmative action because we have a history of racism and a racial oppression in this country, I couldn't, dis I couldn't agree more that we do have that history in this country. But that history of racial oppression applies more significantly to one group than to all others, and that is to African Americans. African Americans were brought here in the hold of slave ships against their will, and they were enslaved for uh, until they were freed in the middle of the 19th century for more than 150 years. Uh, they, they were enslaved in the United States. The stain of that oppression is the original sin of America. And it is something that I think, I don't know when, not in my lifetime, will we ever see that stain uh, removed. So that is one group that has, in fact, suffered tremendous oppression. Native Americans also have suffered oppression. Not as significant uh, as African Americans, but quite significant. Their lands were taken, they were put onto reservations, they were mistreated, uh, and so they have suffered oppression. But when you look at Hispanics who have faced discrimination, but nothing like 
the oppression that African Americans face. And yet, Hispanics, too, are eligible for uh, programs uh, that give preference based on race. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the groups that has faced real racial oppression, including during the Second World War, being rounded up and put into essentially concentration camps, uh, were Asian Americans. And yet they are disadvantaged by these programs today. So if you're t talking about this program as somehow making up for sins of the past, it seems that it ought to be a whole lot more narrowly tailored than it is. But there is another argument that I'd like to put forward against giving preference based on race and putting uh, people into situations where they are given essentially extra points in one way or another, sometimes more subtly than in other ways, uh, in order to be admitted to schools. One of the things that our studies have shown is that students who are admitted with lower grades and lower test scores have greater likelihood of dropping out, not completing their uh, degrees within six years, that's the look back period we looked at, and having lower grades in the courses in which they took. And that's because students, given that kind of preference are often mismatched with the institutions where they end up going to school. So that a student uh, in California who might have done very well at the University of California at Riverside gives, uh, on the basis of racial preference, is admitted to UC Berkeley or admitted to UCLA back before proposition, uh, the proposition that outlawed uh, that kind of racial preference in California. What happened after those racial preferences were outlawed is that we actually saw an expansion of the number of black and Latino students going to the University of California system, but they ended up going to different schools. And guess what happened? They ended up graduating rather than not graduating at schools for which their skills and preparation uh, were not equal to the students uh, that they were competing with. So I think when we, we talk about trying to help people and trying to move and, and make progress, you don't necessarily give someone an advantage if you put them into a situation where they are not able to compete, where they are being given some racial preference, but it is not gonna make up for some of the skills that may be lacking. And I think that brings me to my last point, which is that, and I think it's what uh, Professor Kennedy talked about at the end. When we're talking about affirmative action in higher education, much less in graduate schools or out in the employment field, we are talking about affirmative action for the privileged few. We are not talking about the problems of the many. And the problems that uh, are in the African American community today and the Latino community have to do not with whether or not you get affirmative action to get into college, it has to do with something far more basic, and that is what happens in K through 12 education. And the fact is that students today who come from lower income homes and attend public schools in America, in uh, our cities, tend to be uh, deprived of a decent education. Not much has changed from the time when I was going out and trying to recruit Mexican-American students to, to the University of Colorado and today. Students who were coming into my classroom uh, were reading at the third and fourth grade level and yet being put into a college uh, to try to compete on an equal footing. Uh, that same thing happens today. And the real problem is that we are not making opportunities available to build the skills so that students, once they get into college, are able to compete on the same footing. If we spent half of the attention, half of the effort that we do on higher education and affirmative action and employment and spend that on trying to restructure our elementary and secondary schools so that they actually taught students skills that would allow them to compete on an equal footing, I think we'd be a lot better off and we would do a lot more to advance uh, both African Americans and Latinos. Thank you.
so much. My, there we go. My first question will be for Ms. Chavez since uh, Professor Kennedy was able to go first. Uh, and uh, you spoke about the mismatch in students not actually being prepared and being admitted into colleges uh, where they could not, in fact, succeed and, and, and not, not graduate. Uh, and, and my question is, uh, Professor Kennedy said, well, you, he's not advocating all affirmative action, and that affirmative action program was obviously not a sensible affirmative action program. And so my question is, do you throw out all affirmative action because there are some that are problematic? In particular, the thing that we discover in uh, law school admissions is that uh, the, because of cultural insensitivity on SATs and LSATs, uh, the scores of uh, the, the scores don't, in fact, reflect a student's ability. So, a black student, a Native American student, a Latino Latina student, um, will actually perform at the same level in school with a much lower LSAT because of the cultural difficulties with that test. So, if we have a colorblind admission policy, we can't, in fact, account for that. So, so what do we do? Well, uh, you know, I don't know as much about the LSAT as I do about the SAT, and the SAT is generally good at predicting first-year grades. I don't know if the LSAT predicts first-year grades for law students or not, but, but that is its normal, that's its purpose, and it's validated uh, for that and apparently does a pretty good job of predicting. What you're telling me is that it doesn't necessarily predict, in your experience, uh, the performance of students uh, in law school. If that were true, you would expect that the pass rates for the bar exam would be the same for black and white students, uh, and they're not. Uh, they are substantially lower for African-American students. And again, it's my theory that in large part that is because many of those students who are taking the bar exam have been mismatched with the school they ended up going to. Uh, and if they had gone to a school uh, where their LSATs would have allowed them uh, to get in along with everyone else and they had the same LSATs as their fellow students, the likelihood is I think they would do better on the bar exam. So I don't think you're necessarily serving the needs of the students you're trying to help if you ignore what are generally pretty good predictors. Now, are LSATs the end all and be all? Probably not. I, I read enough of, of Professor Kennedy's books to know that he didn't have the LSAT scores to get into Yale, but he got in anyway. Um, you know, people can be bad test takers. Uh, whether one says that that's true of all members of a group, um, I got disadvantaged because apparently I was a good test taker, and suddenly that must have meant that I wasn't disadvantaged, even though I grew up quite poor and was poor at the time that I, you know, was uh, up for that scholarship. Uh, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and defend all test scores, but I will defend the principle that. One should have one set, one criteria uh, that should be applied to all. And if a group of students cannot meet that criteria, if a university is really interested in helping those students, it ought to create a program that perhaps is an extra year or an extra semester that tries to bring whatever the deficiencies are up so that that student can compete on his or her own merit. And that's the kind of affirmative action program that I thought I was getting started at the University of Colorado and it ended up not turning out that way, but a program which brought students in who weren't prepared but gave them the skills to be able to compete. That kind of affirmative action takes longer, it's harder to do, it's probably more expensive, but it's a whole lot more successful. I would maintain than programs that just look the other way and say, we'll have one set of rules that apply to whites and Asians and a different set of rules that apply to blacks and Hispanics. Thank you, Ms. Chavez. Uh, Professor Kennedy, uh, it'd be easier if I just gave you that same question, but I'm not. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my question for you is, uh, Ms. Chavez uh, makes a point that uh, if you advantage one group, you will disadvantage another group. Uh, and how do you address that with your sensible affirmative action? Yeah, programs? I think that's true. I think that's true. 
I don't, I think, you know, I think it's, we are fooling ourselves if we um, don't accept that we face a dilemma. If there are 100 seats in a school, let's take this school. I mean, this is a selective school. Well, it is. There are more people, you know, the, 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 this school turns down people. I'm sure this school turns down people who've tried really hard and who, if they got in here, would be just fine students and do really great things. But this school has a scarcity. This is a selective school. So what does one do? If, there's a, if, 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 the, if you have a certain number of seats, bringing in some people is going to mean that there are going to be some people who are not going to be able to you know, be in those seats. There is, a, there is a dilemma that we face. So that's right. If you have various sort, which, whichever way you do it, if you, if you say, for instance, that our society needs more people who are quantitatively, have a quantitative disposition, that's going to disadvantage the people who are into poetry. That's right. No, that's true. If you say that we want more people in state, that's going to disadvantage the people out of state. If you say that we have, you know, we have, we have to do something in the face of the oppression that's been in the United States, we're going to have to bring in more racial minorities. Will that disadvantage whites? Yes, it will. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say no, it won't. Yes, it will. <laughs> Question, is that justifiable? Now, here, here, let me make, I would not defend any affirmative action plan whatsoever, any other plan, if the basis of that plan was, I want to stick it to white people. No, I'm resentful of white people. I think white people are inferior. I don't want to educate white people. I want them to know their place. I want them to be lesser than. Anything like that, count me out. I'm against. I'll attack that. That's reprehensible. Is that what's going on with affirmative action in the United States? No. No. What's going on in the United States, whether, you know, and again, I'm not defending every affirmative action plan. There's no affirmative action plan I know of, however, that has the character that I just described. And furthermore, you know, we're talking about affirmative action. Affirmative action, what is affirmative action? Who is behind affirmative action? Affirmative action is imposed by the authorities, the existing authorities at these various institutions. Authorities, by the way, which are for the most part dominated by whites. Now, one of the things that's really quite ironic that's happened is just ideologically, ideologically, you have people who, you know, very often, you know, they're talking about the courts. And they say, geez, you know, these courts, the, the, the courts ought to be more attentive to the voice of the people. They ought to be more attentive to the play of politics. But in this area, affirmative action is the voice of the people. Affirmative action is the voice of politics. There are some jurisdictions, Chavez talked about California, the people of California said we don't want affirmative action. Okay, they got rid of it. 
Okay. Okay. If that happens, if as a political measure, people say they get rid of affirmative action, my view is okay. I think it should be a political question. The Supreme Court of the United States, however, is on the verge of stepping in and saying, this is not a political question. The people in Texas, it's the people in Texas who have imposed affirmative action in Texas. I say let the people of Texas decide the question. Now, one last thing, one last thing. I want it to be quite clear, by the way, I want to be very clear about the positions that my debating adversary, and I say adversary, I didn't say enemy. <laughs> well, that's important. I think that, you know, words are important. Um, Ms. Chavez is, I view, an adversary. We're, you know, ideological. We, we, we see the things differently. I do not view her as, a, as an enemy. I view her as a reasonable person. We, 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 we differ. We differ about things. Note the degree to which actually we have agreed this evening. Note that. I think it's very important because actually, as far as I see it, Ms. Chavez has conceded a lot of ground to my camp. <laughs> she says that, you know, she's against certain sorts of affirmative action plans that she sees that are in existence and she doesn't like the way they are designed. Now, we might agree or disagree about that, but as a matter of principle, as a matter of principle, I have not heard her say, now, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this down as a gauntlet, <laughs> She can say it. I want to hear it if she believes it. She has not said that as a matter of principle, our society ought not be attentive to the need for reform along lines of race. She has not said that. That, to me, is a very important line. Because on this side of that line, we can then debate questions of design, how to do it. Are we going too far in admitting people who actually, you know, it's not going to be good for them, it's not going to be good for the institution, it's wasteful. Those are design questions. That's different than an issue that is abroad in our country, because there are people who do take the position that it does not matter if you have a, if a school happens to be all white, their position is, that's okay. So long as it wasn't, you know, purposely kept all white, tough luck if it's all white. That's not my position, and I don't hear it being her position, but we can be quiet and see. <laughs> so we're going to open up the floor. Uh, Ryan has the mic. So Ryan, I see, okay, I see four hands, Ryan, and then one way in the back. <laughs> I, I think... Um, hello, my name is Alicia Kirkland. I'm a senior here at Lewis and Clark, and my question is for Ms. Chavez. Um, so I basically I want to know what your opinion on historically black colleges and universities are, as they are um, functions kind of of affirmative action, a place for black students to get an education that's kind of from and for from black people and to black students. So just what's your position on those? Well. 
I'm an integrationist, um, and I think uh, Professor Kennedy picks up on that. I think he and I have actually talked about this uh, many, many years ago. I believe that our society is better off if we all learn to get along, and we don't learn to get along if we're not around people who are different from us. So um, I believe in integration. Uh, historically, black colleges exist because black people were denied the ability to go to the University of South Carolina. They were denied the ability to go to schools uh, in many parts of this country. Uh, and therefore, institutions rose up to serve that population. Uh, I don't believe in separate but equal. Um, I would rather see all colleges um, have open admissions and admit uh, anyone uh, who can qualify and meet the same requirements as anyone else. In fact, historically black colleges are not segregationist. They do in fact admit white and Latino and Asian and anybody else uh, that wants to go to them. Um, in terms of philosophically whether I think that's the best place for someone to be, I don't know. Um, I guess it depends on the individual because I believe in integration, because I think it's helpful for people to uh, live in a world and work in a world in which there are people from different backgrounds, that we're enriched by that. Um, if I were uh, African American, I probably would not want my children to go to an African American, uh, historically black college. Uh, I think that might not be the best experience. On the other hand, I can see circumstances based on one's individual family experience where someone might think that was the most nurturing environment. As long as race is not a barrier in admission, as long as um, it's not a criterion to, to get into a university, I don't have a problem with it. Um, it is not, it would not be my personal choice in those circumstances. Sorry, everybody. Um, so I have a question for both of you, actually. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm saying sorry because I'm a co-chair, so we didn't actually pass it around. Um, but um, thinking of the best way to phrase it, so I'm familiar with a particular case about affirmative action, Greta v. Bollinger, and um, one stipulation in there is that schools have a legitimate interest in diversity. And you b brought this up earlier, and that is kind of one of the most stressed points when people talk about affirmative action is diversifying their campuses, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to know what you both think about the responsibility of the institution and those higher up who are admitting these students to see that they are successful. So one, implementing programs that um, support them throughout their four years that they're there, not just um, you know, admitting, admitting them to the college and then saying, good luck. Um, and two, what you think about um, that stipulation in general, because my experience with it at Lewis and Clark in particular has been that um, it is your, I guess, purpose as a student of color to educate the white students, and we admitted you for that purpose. It's like, oh yeah, so we brought you here so that we can talk, you can be in this environment and we can diversify and then white students can learn about what it's like to be a person of, of X, Y, Z, race, whatever, um, or ethnicity and background, and then hopefully we'll have a less racist society. I really think that's not true. I think it um, has really, really problematic and I don't like that idea, so I wanna know what you think of that stipulation and just what responsibility does your institution have to prevent that? Okay. Wow. There's a lot there. I mean, uh, the, the diversity rationale for affirmative action was, um, I think that there was, a, there was a wonderful lawyer by the name of Archibald Cox. He was, one, he was Solicitor General of the United States. He was a member of the Harvard Law School faculty for a long time, very outstanding lawyer. And he articulated this idea of diversity uh, and, and higher education as a compelling reason to take race into account, and then that was embraced by Lewis Powell at the Supreme Court, and the, the Supreme Court has now embraced that. Again, I think there's you know something to it, but frankly, like I said, I, I think that that's, I think there, there, there are better reasons. I think that the Supreme Court wanted to sort of get away from the reasons that I mentioned, particularly the first one, rep reparatory justice. You know, every, every argument 
has difficulties. It's not as if there's one argument that's going to be a conversation stopper. Every argument is going to have its weaknesses, it's going to have its complications, it's going to have its costs. And I think that the Supreme Court is under the impression that this diversity notion is a, is, is a sort of a, a nice compromise, a good way of handling it. And actually, I mean, frankly, th there is something to it. I mean, one idea, one very good sort of political reason for the diversity rationale is everybody is a beneficiary. Everybody can contribute. Under the diversity rationale, it may be that, you know, it may be that Latinos and African Americans provide diversity to a predominantly white campus, but, if, but it might be that the white kid provides diversity to the historically black campus. Diver the diversity rationale opens it up to everybody. And furthermore, the, the theory of the, diverse, of the diversity rationale is everybody benefits. It's not just, you know, the Latino kid or the black kid that's benefiting, the white kid is benefiting too. Now, one thing I must say, here's a, you know, I teach on a, I teach at, a, at a college and I talk with, I, you know, I talk with students and I've, I've heard this, I've heard black students say what you said, you know, gosh, I'm here and sometimes I feel like I'm here to, to educate the white kids, you know, the white kid says, geez, I've never, I haven't been around black people. <laughs> well, no, that's true. No, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Montana. I've never been around black people. <laughs> Can I touch your hair? <laughs> that's true. Now, here's what I say about that. With respect to the diversity rationale, my response is, well, now hold it. To the extent that the theory is that we're supposed to learn from one another, fine. Let's learn from one another. I mean, frankly, I mean, you know, anybody can be obnoxious. So, I mean, a lot depends on exactly how you say what you say. But let's imagine the white kid who's grown up in an area and hasn't been around a black kid, or for that may know, a Latino kid, or you know, and truly, truly, with all genuineness, and genu you know, they're, they're, it's, it's genuine, it's authentic. I don't know, I'm, I haven't been around y'all. I have a question for you. You can tell, you know, I, can, I, can I feel your hair? Now, a lot of people think that's just as a matter of principle, not just, I don't. I really don't. I mean, my, I tell you what, you can feel mine if I can feel yours. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's talk about it. No, this is, a, this is a real issue. Anybody reading the papers knows this is a real issue. This is a real issue with respect to talking and multiculturalism, and I put on a costume, and you think that you feel offended, I don't understand it. My attitude is, let's talk about that. I don't think, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, I, I, I put on a costume, and you come up and you say you're offended, Maybe I don't know why you feel offended. I didn't mean to offend you. Some people mean, meant to offend, but some people didn't. They didn't know. And you know, here's why I feel offended. And by the way, by the way, because you know, I'm a teacher. Students have come to me after class and said they were offended about this, that, or the other. And my response is as follows. Why were you offended? Because frankly, simply to tell me that you're offended is not enough. You might be offended justifiably. You might be offended unjustifiably. 
So please tell me why you're offended so we can have a discussion about it. So I think with respect to the whole thing of, you know, I'm here to teach, well, yeah. I don't think that the institution should run away from that. Um, the white folks can teach. Your white peers have experiences, networks, perspectives that they have. Ask them about it. And similarly, if they ask you about your thing, I say, share. And let's talk and be a little less quick to, you know, get into the sort of, you know, jump off the bridge of indignation. Thank you. So we actually only have time for one. Okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. But your I'll, response. I'll, I'll do quickly. I will say that one of the things that might be of benefit when people are in this kind of mode of thinking is to discover that maybe what we see on the outside isn't all that significant. And that if you have a number of exposures, you're going to find out that, gee, you know, not all black people think alike. Not all Hispanics think alike. Some of them are Republicans, some of them are socialists, some of them are Democrats, you know, some of them are rich, some of them are poor, some of them are smart, some of them are dumb. And that what we see on the outside doesn't matter all that much. I mean, that is, I think, the benefit of getting to know different people is to realize that, yeah, we may have different cultural experiences, we may eat different you know, foods at home, we may have different slang words that we use within our inner group. But basically, when it comes down to core values, we may find that groups of people share something in common who have different outer uh, looks, who, you know, who, who may not share the same color or may not be from the same ethnic group. And that within those groups, there is probably as much difference that as there is between groups. I think that's the most valuable lesson we can learn. Thank you for all of our, nope. <laughs> but, they, but they can come down uh, afterwards, but we are, we are out of time. So can you give a round of applause to our speakers?